Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Andy Cahan, Director of Author Events. Tonight we've invited back historian and journalist Adam Hochschild to tell the timely yet forgotten rags to riches to rags story of Rose Pastor Stokes, an impoverished immigrant and cigar factory worker who married the scion of one of New York's richest families and became one of the country's great social justice warriors. In a review posted this afternoon on NewYorkTimes.com, Jennifer Salai writes, Hochschild is a superb writer who makes light work of heavy subjects. In Rebel Cinderella, he brings his roving curiosity to bear on a figure whose public life coincided with the roiling decades of the early 20th century. With its grotesque economic disparity, vicious anti-Semitism, seething white nationalism, and swelling anti-immigrant fervor. The type of upheaval that he writes about bears an unnerving resemblance to our own. Adam Hochschild was last, year, he was last here for his book, Spain in Our Hearts, but you may know him best for his many other works, including King Leopold's Ghosts and To End All Wars, both of which were National Book Critics Circle Award finalists. He is a co-founder of Mother Jones Magazine, and his many awards include the Dayton Literary Peace Prize, as well as the Los Angeles Times Book Prize for his work, Bury the Chains. It's a pleasure to have him back. Please welcome Adam Hochschild. Well, thank you very much, Andy. It's uh, great to be back here in Philadelphia. And thank you all for coming to hear about a story that is not the latest revelations from Trump's White House, <laughs> nor about a magical cure for the coronavirus, uh, <clears throat> or anything else of that sort. Uh, it's a story from a little over 100 years ago, and most of it is about uh, this woman, Rose Pastor Stokes. The music that you heard as you came in were songs of the Wobblies, uh, the industrial workers of the world, uh, a major force in that era, and they're part of the story. We'll get to them. Um, the book, as I say, is about uh, Rose here, a remarkable but forgotten figure, but it's also in many ways a story of a marriage, <clears throat> a marriage that I think is a window onto life in this country as it was a little more than a century ago, its hopes, its illusions, uh, its enormous injustices. But let me trace her story first. The woman who would become Rose Pastor Stokes was born in Tsarist Russia in the town of Augustov, which today is in the far northeast, part, north, northeast corner of Poland. At that time, of course, there was no Poland. It was part of the Russian Empire. And although she was Jewish, the Jews of Augustov, or at least some of them, did not live in a separate shtetl because Rose's father, from whom her mother separated soon after her birth, lived above his cobbler's shop on the central square of this town. When Rose was born, the Russian Empire was then under the rule of Tsar Alexander II. He was the reformer Tsar, the man who freed the serfs. Uh, he also eased a few of the severe restrictions on Russia's Jews. He was by no means a believer in full human rights, but he was considerably less anti-Semitic than other members of the Romanov dynasty before and after him. However, the lives of Rose and her family and millions of other Jews in Russia was upended by an event that took place two years after her birth, 1881, hundreds of miles away in St. Petersburg, the empire's capital, Alexander II was assassinated. And as soon as he was dead, his successor imposed harsh new restrictions on <clears throat> Russia's Jews and essentially gave the nod from the top to a series of pogroms that took place over the next 25 years. Hundreds of people were killed, Often Jewish homes and shops were burned, leaving their owners homeless. And this, of course, was what spurred the great exodus of millions of Jews from the Russian Empire, first to Western Europe, and then for most of them, onto the United States. 
and among them was Rose, then three years old, and her divorced mother. Uh, the first seven years after they left Russia, uh, they lived in London, living in great poverty in the city's East End. And while there, Rose had the only formal schooling she ever had, less than two years. But it was enough for her to gain the ability to read and write English and to discover a great love for English poetry. At home, she spoke Yiddish. When she was 11 years old in 1890, she and her mother came to the United States, like so many millions of others, on packed immigrant ships like this one. They went to Cleveland, Ohio, and as soon as they got there, Rose was 11 years old, she immediately had to go to work in a cigar factory. Uh, this is the first picture that shows her, taken in 1896. She's the middle figure in the back row there, 16 years old. She worked as a cigar worker for a dozen years, uh, from age 11 to 23. And by the end of that time, she was supporting herself, her mother, and six younger siblings who had been abandoned by a ne'er-do-well stepfather. Uh, for, and she worked both days and often in the evenings as well so that the family could scrape by, scrape by earned $8 a week, which is equal to about $240 a week today. Not a lot on which to support that large a family. And rolling cigars was hard work. The oil from tobacco leaves uh, seeped into your clothes, into your skin. It was impossible to get rid of the smell when you did this all day long. And in every cigar factory, the air had to be kept humid so that uh, the leaves would not crack. That meant in summertime, <coughs> windows were nailed shut so a draft wouldn't uh, blow the humidity away. And very fine dust, tobacco dust, filled the air and filled uh, workers' lungs. Cigar workers had the second highest rate of tuberculosis of any occupation in the United States. Only stone cutters had it worse and Rose would have lung problems for the rest of her life from doing this work. Uh, when she was 21 years old, something happened that completely changed her life. She saw a copy of a Yiddish newspaper published in New York, the Yiddish's Tageblatt, or Jewish Daily News, and that newspaper ran <clears throat> one page in English, and the page invited readers around the country, the newspaper was, was uh, based in New York, but it was trying to go national, invited readers around the country to send in stories, anecdotes, letters, tidbits of information about their lives. And <clears throat> Rose began writing to them. She discovered to her amazement that she could get paid for doing so. And the newspaper gave her a column called Just Between Ourselves, Girls and she was flabbergasted when she received a check for $2 for something that she had written. Uh, <clears throat> she wrote under the pen name of Zelda. She was even more surprised when, <clears throat> after doing this for two years, the Yiddish Tageblatt invited her to New York to write for the English page there at double the salary that she'd been earning as a cigar worker. She arrived in New York in 1903, 23 years old, and imagine how amazing the city looked to a young person at that time, seeing it for the first time. Uh, elevated steam-powered trains like this running on structures above the streets, trolleys below them, uh, underneath the streets, an enormous army of workers was building a subway network that wasn't open yet, uh, and on the streets themselves, there were a few of the new horseless carriages. And of course, skyscrapers like nothing she'd ever seen before. New York in 1903 was a city <clears throat> that would have terrified Donald Trump because it was a city of immigrants. More than half the men in Manhattan 
over 21 years old were foreign born. Uh, New York would soon be the largest city in the world. It was already the largest Jewish city in the world. This is the Lower East Side where Rose would live and work for the next couple of years. What she wrote about for the newspaper were mainly people in the neighborhood like these peddlers, people who worked in shops, uh, people that she met on the street, and as anybody knows who's ever written for <coughs> a daily newspaper, an understaffed daily newspaper, it takes a lot of words to fill up a page. So she was kept very, very busy. One day in the summer of 1903, her editor gave her a different assignment, however. Uh, he assigned her to go and interview someone who worked in a settlement house. Settlement houses, as you probably know, were established in the uh, slum sections of major American cities around this time, actually starting in the late 19th century, and they provided all kinds of services, nutrition programs for children, uh, uh, baths and showers, not just for children, but for adults as well, because these were things that, you know, tenements in, in New York City lacked. They provided adult uh, literacy classes uh, and classes in all kinds of things, music, summer camps for kids, uh, <clears throat> all kinds of things which uh, well-meaning benefactors felt that people in these extremely poor immigrant neighborhoods needed. The settlement house where Rose was sent to do her interview was the university settlement, it's called, on the Lower East Side. And the man she was interviewing was the person in this picture here, a volunteer worker there, James Graham Phelps Stokes, Graham to his friends. And as you can tell from the name, he was Anglo-Saxon Protestant, and he and Rose fell in love. He came from the most different kind of background imaginable. Here, for example, is his family's <laughs> summer home. Uh, <coughs> their summer cottage, as they called it, uh, in the Berkshire Mountains of Western Massachusetts. At the time that it was built in the early 1890s, it was for a time the largest private home in the United States had 100 rooms, and legend has it that one of Graham Stokes' brothers, who was in the class of 1896 at, at, at Yale, sent a telegram to his mother saying, bringing some apostrophe 96 uh, fellows home for the weekend. The apostrophe got dropped from the telegram, <laughs> and his mother replied, many guests already here have room for only 50. <coughs> So when the family was not in this house and in one or two other homes they owned, they lived most of the time in New York, uh, in this mansion at Madison Avenue and 37th Street. It's part of the Morgan Library in New York today. Here are Graham Stokes' parents, uh, each of whom came from families with large fortunes, which they combined. And the family's wealth rested on a number of things, uh, the Phelps Dodge Mining Empire, a lot of real estate in New York, especially luxury apartment buildings on the Upper East Side, and a cluster of gold and silver mines in Nevada, and a railroad that led to them, and more. Here's the extended family. Uh, Graham's parents had nine children, and they and some of their spouses and offspring are in this, in this picture. The boys in the family were expected to play prominent roles in life, and they did. One of them became a famous architect. One of them became an editorial writer for the New York Times. One of them became what today would be called provost at Yale University. A grandson became an Episcopal bishop. Uh, the girls in the family were expected to marry well. And they did. One of them married a nobleman in Europe and became a baroness. Another married into the family of a former secretary of state. Graham Stokes, however, took a somewhat different route than his brothers and sisters. After graduating from Yale, he went to medical school at Columbia. And 
working as a medical student on a horse-drawn ambulance, he was exposed to a very different New York than the one that he had grown up in, the New York of the tenements. And he was shocked by what he saw. <clears throat> Immigrants living packed six, seven, eight people to a room, uh, <clears throat> whole buildings where the only toilets were often outdoor outhouses like these. And of course, New York City's tenements in those days often doubled as factories as well, being makeshift uh, work sweatshops for the garment industry. So as I say, he was outraged by what he saw. He became part of the settlement house movement, and he actually went to live in a settlement house, the university settlement that we just saw a photo of, on the Lower East Side, and that was where Rose met him for the first time. Uh, they courted secretly for two years, and then the news leaked, uh, probably because a newspaper reporter bribed a telegraph operator to slip him any uh, interesting information. And it was, this headline is from the front page of the New York Times. It got immense attention all over the world, in Europe and Australia. Uh, here it is as the lead story in the New York evening world. And as you can see, what attracted attention was that it was not just a marriage of someone extremely rich and someone extremely poor, but it was also an inter-ethnic marriage. And Jewish Gentile marriages at that time were extremely unusual. So both class and ethnic differences. And of course, we're still fascinated by those things today. It's what makes us so interested in Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. This same newspaper immediately signed up Rose to write a series of articles calling her the genius of the ghetto. Uh, despite the well-concealed uh, opposition of his family, uh, Graham and Rose got married on July 18th, 1905, which was Rose's 26th birthday. Graham was seven years older. And the press remained fascinated by them, and they lived in a blaze of publicity for years. The core of the public's fascination, of course, was that here seemed to be the Cinderella story. Uh, Prince Charming coming and rescuing poor, virtuous Cinderella from her humble hearth and bringing her to live in his castle. And what is it that has always fascinated us about the Cinderella story? I think it's uh, curiosity about whether the people involved will be transformed. Will Cinderella flourish and thrive in the castle? Will Prince Charming be softened by her love in some way? Uh, and of course, we hope that love will conquer all the differences between them. So the public continued to watch their lives with enormous fascination for years. Here's a picture of Rose uh, taken the year after they married. However, their lives did not fit the Cinderella script, for Graham to some degree had left the castle and Rose had no desire to live in one, even though they often stayed at one of the houses of his parents, it always made her uncomfortable. She and Graham were both acutely conscious that they lived in a country with enormous disparities of wealth. Some people lived as Graham's family did, others were desperately poor and often worked in dangerous conditions as well, like these child coal miners in West Virginia. In 1906, the year after they married, Rose and Graham joined the group that they thought had the best answers to such problems, the Socialist Party. Uh, at that time, and for many years, the leader of the party was Eugene V. Debs, a noble, charismatic, much beloved man, five times a candidate for president. He had begun life as a railway worker and then became leader of the Railway Worker Union uh, and when he campaigned for president in 1908, it was in a special train called the Red Special that flew red flags and was draped with red bunting. And when engineers of passing locomotives recognized it coming along the track, they 
blew long blasts on their whistles and were thrilled to see him. Uh, Graham Stokes also ran for office that year as a uh, candidate for the New York State Legislature, and he and Debs were on the platform together when the Red Special came to New York City. Rose went out and campaigned for them. Uh, neither Graham nor Debs won their seat, but people still remained fascinated by this couple. Everyone still saw it as the Cinderella story. Their marriage inspired two novels. Here's one of them. And this novel was then turned into a silent film. Uh, unfortunately, the film has been lost, like many films of that era, but we still have the promotional photos from it of the actors playing the roles inspired by Rose and Graham. I have no idea what they're supposed to be saying in this scene, but your guess is as good as mine. Despite all these Cinderella fantasies, this was a time when millions of Americans, even those who were not living in great poverty, began becoming aware of such injustices in this country. And one episode that dramatized uh, this was involved clothing workers in New York City, uh, workers who worked in the Triangle Shirtwaist Company just off Washington Square in New York. Uh, a terrible fire took place there, the workers were trapped on one of the upper floors, unable to get out because there was an inadequate fire escape that collapsed under the weight of people crowding onto it. The door to a stairwell where they might have escaped was locked to keep out union organizers. 146 people were burned to death or leapt out the window to their death to escape the flames. Of the dead, almost all were women Half of them were teenagers, and almost all were immigrants, uh, Jews and Italians. 120,000 people marched in a, a funeral procession through New York. More than 300,000 people lined the city's streets. Again, it was one of a number of episodes like that that began to really widen the awareness of the huge disparities of wealth in this country. Rose continued her journalism, uh, but issues like that, about labor and social justice, were now the things that she was writing about. Also, women's rights. She got quite involved with one case that had echoes of the kind of battles that are still going on in the Me Too era today. Uh, one case that drew her attention was that of a woman named Sarah Coton. She worked as a nurse for a doctor in New York whose home and office were in the same building, and Sarah Coton uh, had her living quarters there, a room in the doctor's house. One night, the doctor piped chloroform under her door, and when she was unconscious, he raped her. Some weeks later, she realized she was pregnant. She shot and killed the doctor, then surrendered to police. Rose went to the prison where she was being held, interviewed her in Yiddish, told her story at much greater length than anyone else had, and announced publicly that she would pay Sarah Coton's legal expenses, and once she was released from prison, would give her and the baby a place to stay. The trial was delayed until Sarah Coton gave birth in prison, and then she was finally found not guilty in part because another woman came forward who had been assaulted by the same doctor. Starting a few years after Rose and Graham married, for a decade or more, the United States was convulsed by strikes with hundreds of thousands of workers walking out every year. And this was a time when labor unions had almost none of the rights that they acquired later on. Strikes were often suppressed by police. This is Chicago police uh, arresting a striking garment worker, uh, or by troops. These are <coughs> striking clothing workers in Massachusetts, uh, a strike incidentally organized by the IWW, the Wobblies, whose music we heard. One big strike of garment workers was in New York City. You can see here 
the signs are in English, Italian, Yiddish, and Russian. And Rose became heavily involved, speaking to groups of strikers often many times each day. Uh, it was in this strike that she really came into her own as an organizer, and she was an immensely popular speaker, speaking in English or Yiddish as the occasion required, and she fairly quickly became recognized as one of the great radical orators of her time. Uh, sadly for me, writing this book, it was just a decade or so too early for audio or video, so I couldn't actually hear her voice, but I found countless letters from people in her files saying, you know, this was the most inspiring speech I ever heard, you know, I would travel miles to hear you speak again, or newspaper reporters writing in similar tones, and one of them at one point described a meeting where he said, after she spoke, the audience wouldn't leave the room even when the lights were turned off. <laughs> so, attracting all this attention for the speeches she gave, uh, Rose soon eclipsed her husband, and the ongoing cascade of newspaper stories were much more about her than about them as a couple. And there are signs that he was not happy about this. The most interesting strike that Rose got involved in was one of hotel and restaurant workers in New York City in 1912, also organized by the Wobblies. Wobbly organizers walked into one restaurant or hotel dining room after another, usually just as lunch or dinner was about to be served. The organizer blew a whistle, the waiters walked out. They did this at the Waldorf Astoria, Del Monaco's, the Luncheon Club of the New York Stock Exchange, and dozens of other restaurants as well. Rose was on the strike committee. She addressed many rallies of striking waiters, she helped handle publicity for the union. She publicized the miserable conditions in which they worked. And in her papers, there are many, many letters of thanks for waiters who were involved in this strike. One of the hotels uh, that was struck was the Ansonia Hotel on Broadway between 73rd and 74th Streets in New York, still there today as an apartment house. And it had <coughs> several dining rooms and was a famous gathering place for musicians, show business people, and mobsters. Its owner was Graham's uncle, William Earl Dodge Stokes, or Uncle Will as the family called him. He was a passionate hater of labor unions, immigrants, and much more, and he was absolutely furious that his own nephew's wife was organizing his own workers uh, to get them to walk out, and he wrote her a, a very, very angry letter about this. And he will later come back into the story, you'll see. Uh, let me turn to another aspect of Rose's and Graham's lives. One of the things that made them so fascinating for me to write about was their friends. They knew and worked with uh, what to me are the most interesting people in the United States from that era. Here's Rose on the right with Eugene Debs. Behind them is Max Eastman, editor of The Masses, the country's best magazine at that time, in many ways a precursor of The New Yorker. They also knew the wealthy heiress, Mabel Dodge, uh, later Mabel Dodge Luhan, who ran a famous salon in her Greenwich Village house where the great questions of the day were debated, and she sometimes asked Graham Stokes to moderate one of these debates. Also in their circle was Big Bill Haywood, the leading figure in the IWW, a former miner, cowboy, saloon card dealer, charismatic orator, famous for using his fists when required, and also famous for being able to recite long passages of Shakespeare by heart. Another friend was John Reed, probably the finest journalist of his generation, a man who was determined to be at the center of the action, whether that meant being jailed with striking workers in New Jersey or being in the midst of revolution in Mexico or Russia. They were friends also with Lincoln Steffens, leading muckraker, W.E.B. Du Bois, the greatest black intellectual of his time, uh, Mother Jones, Mary Harris Jones, 
They knew all of these people, and many of these folks were their house guests at one time or another. Upton Sinclair was another friend, the man to whose novel, The Jungle, we owe our pure food and drug laws. As Sinclair was writing that novel, he sent it chapter by chapter to Graham Stokes to get his comments. Another friend was Margaret Sanger, in the middle in this picture, the birth control pioneer. Birth control is something that we, we take for granted today, but the Brooklyn Clinic where this photo was taken was shut down by the police and Sanger was sent to jail. Rose was active in the campaign for birth control when talking publicly about these things was against the law. Uh, another friend of theirs, uh, Emma Goldman, was arrested many times. This is a mugshot taken on one of her arrests, the anarchist firebrand. And the nice thing is that many of these people left us their recollections of Graham and Rose. Uh, Emma Goldman, for instance, who was always very blunt, thought Graham was something of a stuffed shirt and couldn't understand how Rose put up with him. The period of American life when all of these folks were active was a remarkable time, a, a period when so many people believed that the world could be changed and that a new and more just society was soon going to come into being. Sadly though, something happened that brought that period of enormous confidence and optimism to an end, the First World War. And not only did that war shatter innumerable lives, uh, killing more than nine million soldiers and untold numbers of untold millions of civilians, but it also shattered the radical dream that the working classes of different countries uh, would never fight each other. The United States, however, did not join the war when it started. Uh, American socialists and others on the left agitated very strongly for the U.S. to stay out of the war. Rose, Emma Goldman, and many other friends joined something called the Women's Peace Party and took part in demonstrations like this one. However, in April 1917, President Woodrow Wilson went before Congress and asked it to declare war. And before long, American troops began <clears throat> going to France, soon in huge numbers, and by mid-1918, they were heavily involved uh, in the most fierce fighting. Here at home, the country was swept by war fever, by ferocious government propaganda, like this U.S. Army enlistment poster. There was also a tremendous paranoia about spies. And there was enormous hostility, uh, not just officially from the government, but unofficially from a press that echoed the government line, uh, against anti-war radicals of all kinds. You can't, I think the caption at the top of this is not legible from where you're sitting, but it says, now for a roundup, and shows Uncle Sam rounding up the IWW and other anti-war forces. Many radicals, however, still felt very strongly that the war was a huge mistake. Uh, however, left-wing groups of all kinds had their offices raided and wrecked by police and people from the Justice Department. This is the wobbly office in New York City where I'm sure Rose was many times after such a raid. The First World War created a rift between Rose and Graham. She eventually became firmly convinced that it was a terrible mistake for the United States to join this war and she began speaking out against it. Graham was so enthusiastic about the war that he enlisted and actually went into uniform. He was too old to get sent overseas, despite many tries, but served for several years in the New York National Guard, uh, never coming closer to combat, however, than marching down Fifth Avenue in a parade, such as in this one, in this picture. Something else that divided Rose and Graham happened in late 1917, the second phase of the Russian Revolution when the Bolsheviks seized power. Rose was for them, Graham was against them. She continued speaking out against the war and now in favor of the Russian Revolution as well. And this 
drew the outrage of many people, including Graham's uncle, the angry hotel owner. You remember him. Here's a report from him, about him, from the files of the Bureau of Investigation, predecessor of the FBI. And in case you can't read it in the back, I'll just, I'll just read it. Agent received words from, word from W.E.D. Stokes that Rose Pastor Stokes, at various times in her residence at 88 Grove Street, New York City, held meetings with socialists and IWW, and if a search was made of the premises, some valuable information could be secured. A few days later, we know from Justice Department records, he called the Justice Department, told them that Rose and Graham were out of town, and that it was a good chance to search the house, and they did so. The Bureau of Investigation kept a close eye on Rose. Agents followed her. Stenographers transcribed her speeches, which was very useful to me. And after one anti-war talk, she was arrested. Uh, and at that time, the Espionage Act, which is still in effect today, an amended form, was in effect. Uh, you drew great penalties for opposing the war effort. She was put on trial and sentenced to 10 years in prison. Graham put up bail money, they appealed the case, and eventually the sentence was overturned on appeal, so she didn't have to go to jail. But by this point, their marriage was in great trouble. They remained together for seven more years, but very uneasily because they were going radically different directions in politics. Rose joined the Communist Party. In 1922, she went to Russia as an American delegate to a meeting of the Communist International. And like far too many people at that time, she thought that in Soviet Russia, she had found paradise. Graham looked for paradise in a different direction, uh, took up a much, an interest from much earlier in his life in religion, and particularly in blending the traditions of Hinduism and Christianity. They got divorced very bitterly in 1925. This put them back on the front pages for the last time. And as soon as they were no longer a couple, the press completely lost interest in them. But happily for me, they saved all of their letters, Rose kept a diary, and they wrote dueling unpublished memoirs. Hers was finally published, but only about 50 years later. Not to mention the recollections of their friends. So there was rich, rich material to work from and to try to reconstruct their relationship and see inside this marriage and try to figure out what made it work. Uh, and to have a ringside seat to this really quite remarkable period of American history. So, do historians a favor, save your letters, keep diaries, write memoirs, we need raw material. After the divorce, Rose, as a matter of principle, refused to accept any alimony, and so she was reduced to poverty again. She remarried, but to someone who was as poor as she was, uh, she very soon came down with cancer and died at the age of 53 in 1933. Graham also remarried, uh, but no leap out of his class this time. He married the daughter of a railroad executive and lived on to the age of 88, dying in 1960. So that's their story. I wish I could say they changed the world. They didn't but perhaps through their eyes we can see a world that needed changing and that still does today. And I hope you'll enjoy getting to know them as much as I did. So if you've got comments or questions, I would be glad to hear them. How, how did the story come to your attention? Uh, the story came to my attention because uh, uh, about 25 years ago, I was writing a book about Russia. And so I was reading a lot of Russian and Soviet history. And I saw a photograph of the American delegates to a meeting of the Communist International at which uh, both Trotsky and Lenin spoke in Moscow in 1922. And there among these uh, American delegates 
was this striking looking woman with a very Jewish face and this New York high society last name. And I wonder, you know, could she be related to that Phelps Stokes family? I, I, this was actually pre-internet, so I couldn't quickly check that in the way that one does today. But I saved, I made a copy of this photograph and saved it because I was so curious. I was then in the middle of writing another book and I got on to another couple. And then uh, uh, four or five years ago, I was reading something about American history in that period, saw a passing mention of her name and realized she was related to that family. And as often is the case with things that I end up writing about, I also realized I was not the first person to be fascinated by her. Indeed, uh, between 1918 and 1921, uh, the year that included Rose's trial and sentence of 10 years under the Espionage Act, she was the woman whose name appeared most often in the American press. There were five men, including Woodrow Wilson and Henry Ford, who were mentioned more often, but a newspaper clipping service did a tabulation at the time and found that she was the woman whose name was most mentioned. And if you look at any database of old newspapers today, you'll find the same thing. There, there are thousands and thousands of mentions of her in the press. And there are scholars here and there who have written PhD theses, uh, one scholarly monograph, an article in an academic journal uh, about these folks, but they remain surprisingly unknown uh, to a more general audience. Did they have any children? No, they did not have any children. Um, they had a lot of collateral descendants because each of them came from uh, large families, uh, great nieces and nephews and so on. Uh, and actually, I got an email this afternoon from a great nephew of Graham Stokes who said, thanks for your book. I found it interesting and I'll be at your talk in Washington, D.C. tomorrow. So be interested to hear what he has to say. I know that you highlighted so many of her contributions, you know, to American society, of course, and how popular she was during the day. Why do you suppose, is, do you suppose that she's not as popular because she was a Jewish woman, because she supported the Communist Party, as anybody else would have been, you know, if they, you know, yeah. did some of the things that she did during that day? Well, the question of popularity is an interesting one. I think that one thing, uh, I don't think it was because she joined the Communist Party. That was later in her life, in the 1920s. And this was sort of the point at which the press lost interest uh, in her, because communism was a very marginal movement in this country at that time. But earlier on, there was, I think for, for, for many readers, an enormous appeal in the idea that somebody could marry their way magically out of poverty. Uh, you know, the, the idea of getting rich quick by whatever means uh, has always had enormous appeal. I mean, that was the success of the TV show The Apprentice, and we know what happened to the, the host of that. Uh, but people hoping to magically not be the one who was fired, but instead the one who was given the job. Uh, in addition, uh, it's clear from reading the recollections of people who met her that Rose had enormous charm and that she knew exactly how to speak to whatever audience she was talking with. I mean, I've looked at transcripts of a lot of her talks, some of them made by these government stenographers who followed her around, some of them by newspaper reporters, and you can see how she adjusted what she said to the audience she was talking to. If she was speaking to a Christian book, to, to a Christian uh, audience, uh, audience with a lot of church members, she talked about social justice in terms of Bible stories. Uh, if she was talking to an audience of workers, she described her own experience in the cigar factory and how at one time she was very pleased to find uh, herself uh, rewarded by the boss for uh, working so fast and then suddenly realized that there was a speed up in place and that her fast work was imposing a greater burden on everybody else. If she talked to a sort of middle class women's club, 
uh, she would talk about things like the triangle fire that it was easy to get people to sympathize with. She never spoke from a text. She never used notes. She had a knack of adjusting um, what she said to whoever she was, she was speaking to. And I think that accounts for her, her considerable po popularity. She also obviously knew how to interact with people. She had a wide range of friends and acquaintances. There are letters to her and from her to people in all walks of life, from these striking waiters to people like Lincoln Steffens and John Reed uh, and so forth. And she could navigate very well on the class level, you know, becoming, you know, getting along with Graham's family, even though she didn't like the politics of some of them. Uh, so I wish I had known her, and I could have told you more. <laughs> I noticed that one of the sub uh, headings of their impending marriage was that an allusion was made to a uh, complimentary report that she had made of him that started the love affair. And that didn't sound like the woman that you've just described. My gut feeling is that the oppositeness of their lives is a large part, uh, I would think, of what drew them to each other, and it sounded like it was a real exciting love for them. And the picture of her in the wedding dress, I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, what, what can you say about, at least for a couple of years, was there real happiness in this uh, union of opposites? And my other question is, did the kind of cancer that she died from stem from uh, lung issues with yeah. the cigars or, I mean, what kind of cancer did she uh, actually die from? Good question. I'll answer the second one first because it's simpler. Uh, she died of metastasized breast cancer and um, there's no way you can prove directly that it was related, but you know, the causes of cancer are mysterious and it could well be that things that you know, tobacco dust breathed into her, her lungs uh, was something that helped stimulate this. Don't forget also that at that time, uh, an awful lot of us in this country, or those people who were alive at that time, were breathing vast amounts of coal smoke because this was what fueled the cities we lived in. Um, what was the nature of their love at the beginning? Uh, I think from Graham Stokes' point of view, here was somebody who looked up to him, who admired the fact that he'd come from this wealthy background but had chosen to go live in a settlement house, uh, obviously cared about uh, injustice. Uh, he was seven years older and really for the first nine or 10 years of their marriage, uh, maybe even a little belong beyond that, the first, first dozen years or so of their marriage, she always assumed that he knew more than she did. He had multiple graduate degrees. Uh, he knew a lot of the you know, leading writers and journalists of the day. He had had time to read much more than she had, not just because she was younger, but because she'd been working, you know, 10, 12 hours a day uh, in cigar factories. So she was kind of in awe of what she saw of his learning. And I think it took a dozen years or so before she really realized that she was smarter and had better political instincts than he did. Uh, I think he and her saw somebody who had a kind of, genuine liveliness, intensity, spark of life that he obviously hadn't seen in the many, many eligible young women who must have been introduced to him uh, over the years because he was well into his 30s uh, when, they, when they first met. The reference to a complimentary portrait of him in that first story was 
this was the article that she wrote about him in the newspaper where she said how impressed uh, she was with this man who was as tall as Lincoln and cared so much about the poor and uh, had such issues on his heart. So she did write this very complimentary story about him in the newspaper. Uh, and it took her some years to realize that he was not quite the man that she thought he was. You said she started in the cigar factory when she was 11. She was obviously terribly, terribly bright. She was a successful journalist. What kind of formal or other education did she have? She had uh, a little less than two years of formal schooling uh, during the time when she was around eight or nine, when she and her mother were living in London. But she did learn to read uh, in English. She loved reading. And she writes in her memoir about being too poor to buy books. But there was one source of reading material that was free in London, which was that there were uh, short bits of poetry on the back of every London omnibus ticket. Uh, and that she would pick these off the street, read the poems, and so forth. Uh, they had one book in the house, which was Charles Lamb's Tales from Shakespeare. And she said she read it and reread it and reread it, and it wasn't until she got to the United States that she really realized there were other books you could, you could read. Uh, one advantage of cigar work is when you, can, when you get good at it and your hands know how to roll the cigars, you can have a book propped up in front of you while you're doing that. And she often did this. Uh, and my guess, uh, I would like to say, because of where we are right now, that I know this for certain, that she was a big library user. But I bet that she was a library user, because we do know that she belonged to a, uh, a sort of a, a Jewish fraternal society in Cleveland. Uh, that had cultural activities at one sort or another, and I found some references in a Cleveland Jewish newspaper to her reciting poetry at one of the meetings of this. So I suspect she used the Cleveland Public Library. I'd love to be able to prove it, but that would be my guess. You made a somewhat jocular reference to the source materials and people should save letters. Can you talk about how you, I mean, I'm very aware of that, having just thrown out cartons and cartons of letters that my mother saved, um, because who wants them? What do you think is going to happen in 50 years? What's going to happen in, in the, so now that now that we're going all electronic? Um, you know, there still is a lot of paper out there, because people do print out emails and so forth. Um, and. Some of us who are hoarders keep all our old emails electronically, although, of course, something may zap through the internet and destroy that all. Um, I don't know. I appreciate the fact that these folks lived in an age when people wrote letters on paper and that I was able to, uh, to read them. They both seem to have saved everything. She, I don't think, saved as much as, as he did. One of, one of the problems you sometimes run into when writing history is that the amount of paper that somebody leaves behind has no relationship whatever to how interesting they are. Uh, Rose was much the more interesting member of this couple to me, didn't leave anywhere near as much stuff behind. Graham left 120 boxes of papers to Columbia University. His brother, who was even less interesting, left 240 boxes to Yale. Uh, and, but nonetheless, I still went through them and found you know, the letters between the brother and the mother talking about this strange new woman that their beloved Graham was marrying. Um, I hope it's going to be as easy to do that as possible for people in the future. But the fact that so much of um, what goes between us these days is in the form of email and text messages may make that more difficult. I don't know. Thank you for being here. Uh, and I'm sure some historians might hate a question like this, so I apologize. But uh, what do you think are some lessons or takeaways for the present 
uh, with regard to uh, social reform, industrialization, progressivism? Well, it's a little depressing to me to <laughs> look back at this era, you know, 120 years ago or so, and see so many problems that are still with us. Uh, we still have enormous disparities of wealth. We have a greater income gap between the top 1% and everybody else today than existed at that time, at the, you know, the height of the Gilded Age and the robber barons. Um, we, uh, labor unions gained a lot for a lot of people in the, the middle years of the 20th century, but their membership has shrunk and shrunk and shrunk. And in this country, as in many other countries, uh, social welfare of all kinds is often to some degree correlated with the percentage of people who belong to labor unions. And of course, I think it's outrageous that tens of millions of people in this country still don't have health insurance. So I would like to take the, the best of the spirit of these folks from uh, a century and more ago, uh, the best of their spirit without the illusions, such as that Soviet Russia was paving the path to the future, but take that spirit uh, and apply it today. And I think there's work for all of us to do. So thank you very much.